Today we're going to be looking at Psalm chapter 9. So hear the word of the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence. For you have maintained my just cause, and you have sat on the throne giving righteous judgment. You have rebuked the nations, you have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. <clears throat> the enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities are rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. And he judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed. A stronghold in times of trouble. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. O you who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may recount all your praises, <coughs> that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sunk into the pit that they made, and the net that they hid for their own foot has been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. The wicked shall return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not always perish, uh, shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail, let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord, let the nations know that they are but men. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you that you reign on your throne because you indeed are a holy God and we rejoice in your grace and your mercy. We ask, O Holy Spirit, just for your outpouring, your work, your change and your transformation now. And we pray, O Lord, that you'd be honored in this time. In Jesus' good name, amen. I remember a very interesting battle of the bands at the high school I attended that they hosted. The music was particularly bad, as you would expect at most high school battle of the bands, but one musical group particularly stood out and was very unique. I don't remember their name, I just know that they sung a song called Cheese Whiz. They came out onto stage with a jar of cheese whiz. They placed the jar of cheese whiz in a very prominent place on the stage. And then they started to rock out. The lyrics were, I love cheese whiz, I love cheese whiz. And they sung this song, these two, this phrase, I love cheese, cheese whiz, over and over again with a distorted guitar riff and kind of out of sync drumming. This, news, this music would be considered noise pollution at best. But guess what? This group didn't care if they sounded good. This group didn't care that they were considered weirdos by the audience. This group didn't give a hoot about what anybody thought about them. All they cared about was that people knew that they loved Cheese Whiz. Now, what on earth does a crazy group of high school students who play bad music and sing about cheese whiz have to do with Psalm 9? As they had a love for cheese whiz and were bold, were bold to declare their love for cheese whiz, they didn't care about what people thought about their love for cheese whiz and what they stood for. We as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ ought to be bold about declaring our great love for Jesus Christ. 
We must make him known. As Psalm 9, 11 says, Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. Tell among the peoples his deeds. Let us not be afraid to stand for the Lord who rules over all things. Let's be confident in the Lord who rules over creation as we see in Psalm 9, 10. Put our trust in him. Let us sing joyfully about the Lord and his graciousness as we see in 9, verse 1 and 2, and as well, verse 11, sing praises is the command there. Psalm 9 is a psalm of David, as the subscript states, to the choir master, according to Muth Lavin, a psalm of David. The context of this psalm fits a number of different issues that David faces in the midst of his life, specifically in the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel. And as we see in Psalm 9, that they are enemies of the Lord and thus enemies of David. But the Lord is faithful to David in the midst of all these enemies that he faces, and the Lord defeats these enemies. Now Psalm 9 is a very unique acrostic psalm. First we're going to talk about acrostic. This means that the first sentence starts with the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and the second sentence or phrase starts with the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet all the way down to the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Biblical authors used acrostic writing so that Psalms could be more easily memorized. <clears throat> but Psalm 9 is a different acrostic psalm. Because the first half of the Hebrew alphabet is used in Psalm 9, and then Psalm 10 as well as acrostic, it ends where Psalm, or it starts where Psalm 9 ends and continues to the end of the Hebrew alphabet. So it is thought that Psalm 9 and 10 were actually once combined and originally put together but later separated. But we do have, kind of have two separate themes between Psalm 9 and 10. Psalm 9 focuses upon the Lord's faithfulness in the past and Psalm 10 focuses upon the future deliverance of David and the people of God. The truths about the Lord that are mentioned in the psalm are many. Like I talk about many times, if you highlight the references to the Lord in the psalm, you would see the truths of the Lord explained very clearly. Now there's many different outlines that people have of this psalm. I'm going to break the psalm into three parts. Verses 1 to 6, praise the Lord. Verses 7 to 14, we hear about a powerful God who is exalted and reigns and sits on his throne. In verse 15 to 20, prevail over the wicked. The Lord prevails <coughs> over the wicked. So let's look at this first section. Verse 1 to 6, praise the Lord. Where you see what David is doing. I'll give thanks to the Lord. I'll recount all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad, I will exalt in you, I will sing praises to your name, O Most High God. This psalm starts out like many of the psalms do, with either a call to praise, or the psalmist telling you that he is praising the Lord. And note that there are five verbs here to describe worship to the Lord. What does joyful worship look like? Psalm 9, 1-2 tells us. We see complete joy in the Lord. For who he is and what he has done. Let's look at that first command. I will give thanks. David is thankful to the Lord. But David is really thankful because David says that he will give thanks to the Lord with his whole heart. This is not a half-hearted thankfulness or only verbal said with the mouth, not with the heart. With David's everything... He gives thanks to the Lord. Number two, he says, I will recount. This is actually the Hebrew word to write. But in this context, it refers to recounting. David, while he's thankful, he reflects. He remembers all the wonderful deeds of the Lord. The wonderful deeds of the Lord are the many great works of the Lord that he has accomplished. The Lord is a sovereign creator over the universe. He 
spoke and all creation came out of nothing. That's a wonderful deed of the Lord. <coughs> the Lord is a God who saves because the Lord did the wonderful deed of deliverance. The Lord delivered Israel from Egypt. The Lord delivered Israel from other enemies. Hear how the other Psalms praise the Lord for his great and wonderful deeds. Psalm 40 verse 5 says, You've multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them. Yet there are more that than yet there are more than can be told. In Psalm 86, verse 10, for you are great, God's great, and you do wondrous things or wondrous deeds. You alone are God. And David recalls all these wonderful deeds. Number three, as you see in verse two, I will be glad. David will also be glad in the Lord. David can be glad in the Lord because of all the great works of the Lord done for David. Think about the deliverance that David experienced when God rescued him from the hand of Saul. Remember, Saul was out to get David in 1 Samuel 26, but the Lord causes Saul and the men with him to fall into a deep sleep. And David is able to get victory over Saul as he takes the spear and jar of water that were placed at the head of Saul. This event humiliate, humiliate, humiliates and humbles Saul. <clears throat> but as followers of Jesus Christ, think how glad you can be because of the grace given to you in Jesus Christ. You can be glad through Jesus Christ because of his mercy, his grace given to you, even though you don't deserve that grace and mercy. Your sins are wiped clean, and the Lord will remember your sins no more because of Christ. That's certainly something to be very glad about. <clears throat> Number four, I will exalt. David will exalt in the Lord. This means he will praise the Lord with joy. And there's certainly much that we can praise the Lord for. Much joy that we can show to the Lord and praise the Lord. And finally, he says, I will sing praise. I'll sing praise to the Lord. But do you see how David describes the Lord? The Lord is described as, O Most High, or the Most High God. The Lord is the Most High God because He stands alone as God. There's no other gods. He's alone exalted and exalted alone as God. The Lord is worthy of praise. The Lord is worthy of delighting in exaltation. Because the Lord is the one and only God. Psalm 97 makes the meaning of the Most High God very clear in verse 9. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. All the gods of the nations are idols and certainly fake gods. But the Lord Most High made the heavens. He's the true in mighty God. Let's look at verses 3 and 4. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before your presence, for you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne, giving righteous judgment. Now we get to the bottom of the issues that David is facing when he wrote this song. We know it says here, David has enemies. And as you read First and Second Samuel, certainly realize that David had many enemies. David had the enemy of Saul, Saul's men, Abner. David had the enemy of Saul's family. David had the enemy of the Philistines. David had the enemies of the foreign nations. Many enemies. <clears throat> but the enemies, they turn back. It says they stumble. It says they perish. These enemies are defeated because of the presence of the Lord. The enemies of David might have seemed to be a threat, but under God's hand they fled from David and they perished. In Psalm 9 verse 4, David reminds us of the power of God. The Lord sits on a throne. The Lord is seated upon the throne and he's a righteous judge who administers justice. Now, many people who attend church in North America, they might not like this statement about the Lord. 
People are not comfortable with a Lord who judges, who sits upon a throne ruling over all the earth. They would rather have a God who allows sin, and all sin being okay. Sin goes unpunished, they want. And a God that holds no one accountable for their actions. But Psalm 9 clearly portrays the Lord as a God who sits on a throne, as it says in Psalm 9-7 as well, and a God who judges with righteousness, as he repeats in Psalm 9, verse 8. It is a wonderful truth and joy to know the Lord sits upon his throne. This means that God is a sovereign God. God is sovereign and rules over and in control of everything that you face in your life. Some prof professing Christians don't like, the, the, don't like this idea of a sovereign God, and I just cannot figure out why. Why would you disregard God and His greatness, God and His glory, God and His word? Why would you think that you're the master of your own fate? Let us not disregard the greatness of God. And let us not certainly think so highly of ourselves that we think that we're the master of our own fate and the captain of our souls. The Lord is enthroned in heaven. And he rules over all creation. Hear what David says in Psalm 103 about God's rule. Psalm 103 verse 19. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. And his kingdom rules over all. <clears throat> Let's look at verses 5 and 6. Of chapter 9 of the Psalms. You have rebuked the nations. You have made the wicked perish. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy came to an end in everlasting ruins. Their cities you rooted out. The very memory of them has perished. <clears throat> in Psalm 9, verse 5 to 6, we see the fate of the wicked, and David doesn't mince any words. The nations are rebuked by the Lord. They're confronted. The nations perish before the Lord. They are no more. The nations have their names blotted out forever. This means that... <coughs> The memory of them will be gone forever. The nations will come to an everlasting ruin. The Lord will have them destroyed forever. The nations' cities will be rooted out. This means that their cities will be destroyed. The nations will have the memory of them perish. They will be remembered no more. Because the Lord is a righteous, sovereign judge, He punishes His enemies who reject them, and who live without reference to him or reverence to him. So that's praise the Lord. Let's look at our second point, powerful God, in chapter 9, verse 7 to 14. We're going to be looking at verse 7 and 8. But the Lord sits enthroned forever. He established his throne for justice. He judges the world with righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. In Psalm 9, 7, there's a but. So he's contrasting the fate of the wicked, that they will end, contrasting that with the eternality of the Lord, with the Lord being eternal, that the Lord is an eternal God. He rules forever. The wicked, they're going to perish. They're not going to last long. Like other Psalms, they'll, they'll fade like the flowers or fade like the grass, but the Lord is enthroned forever. The rule of the Lord is not just in Old Testament times. The rule of the Lord is just not in New Testament times. The rule of the Lord is eternal. Always and forever, the Lord will be reigning and ruling. This means that God has always been a sovereign God. God is presently a sovereign God. And God will always in eternity be a sovereign God. The Lord has established his throne and he rules forever. Next, in verse 8, we see that the Lord is a God of justice. <clears throat> Judges the world with righteousness and the peoples with uprightness. We've, we have a hard time understanding this truth about God judging with righteousness and uprightness, as David declares here in Psalm 9-8. It's difficult because we see so many unjust judges and unjust rulings in our North American context. For instance, Walgreens is a pharmacy chain in the United States and it has had to close many stores and urban locations because there is just so much theft that the company 
cannot make any money. Because of all the theft, the company company cannot be profitable and, and cannot make money. Walgreens is being forced to move out of these urban centers. We see looting people people looting in Walgreens and these videos go viral and nobody does a thing about it. And if they're charged, the perpetrators are not given any justice. And we see that. Well, you can just go in and rip off a store. Nobody cares. Just take it. But this is not how the Lord rules and judges. He rules over all the earth. He's, he will hold people accountable to their actions and he will punish wickedness as we see clearly in this psalm and the rest of the Bible. Well, let's look at verse 9, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble, and those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Someone might think that Psalm 9 is a very negative psalm, but we see the grace of God all throughout Psalm 9. Psalm 9.9 9, the Lord is a refuge, a stronghold in security. In times of trouble, the people of God can find safety under the shelter of the Lord who rules over all creation. And in Psalm 9:10, we see how the people of God ought to respond to the Lord since he's a safe refuge. First, we must trust the Lord. We can trust the Lord because he's a faithful Lord. Trusting the Lord means you have confidence in the Lord and in his character. But next it says we must seek the Lord. Seeking the Lord means that we pursue God and his goodness. And we can embrace and have confidence in this promise here in 9 verse 9. That those who have confidence and pursue the Lord, who seek the Lord, the Lord will not forsake them. Now let's close this section off. At looking at 11 to 14. Sing praises to the Lord who sits enthroned in Zion. There's the third time that... The Lord is described as being enthroned. Tell among the people his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He doesn't forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. O you who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may recount all your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your salvation. David calls these people to sing praises to the Lord. He praises the Lord. Now he calls the people of God to join together to sing praises to the Lord. And the reason we're to sing praises to the Lord is because of his greatness. Where is the Lord? He is seated, enthroned in Zion. Because the Lord is a sovereign God and a ruler over all things, we must praise the Lord. David also commands the people of God to tell the peoples who are the nations the deeds of the Lord. And in verse 13, David says, be gracious to me. David cries out to God for mercy. David is in trouble with those who hate him and seek to kill him. But David knows the grace of God and therefore he can seek grace and mercy from God. How can you seek mercy from God? Because the Lord is merciful and gracious. The reason why David cries out to God for mercy is so, so that he can tell of the great works of God among the people of God. So we had <clears throat> praise the Lord, powerful God who reigns on the throne. This final point, looking at verses 15 to 20, prevail over the wicked. Verse 15 and 16, the nations have sunk into the pit they've made, into the net they hid. Their own feet has been caught. The Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the works of their own hands. Much like Psalm 37 and 57, the wicked set out to harm people, but they ended up experiencing the harm they wish to inflict on others. They sink into the pits they've made. They sink into the nets <clears throat> they have hid. Their feet have been caught. Now imagine up here in the north, setting a trap or a leg snare for a bear, and then you get stuck in the trap. This is what happens to the wicked. But the Lord has made himself known, and he brings judgment. The judgment continues in verse 17 to 18. The wicked shall return to Sheol, all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish. The fate of the wicked is Sheol, which in this context is a place of divine judgment. 
But there's hope that the needy and the poor will not perish. They will not be forgotten. <clears throat> and this psalm ends in verse 19 to 20 with the plea to the Lord. Arise, O Lord. Let not man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord. Let the nations know that they are but men. This psalm ends with David asking the Lord to arise or rise up. David's concern is that sinful people would not prevail over the nations. David prays that the nations would be judged by God. David asks that the nations be put in fear. David asks these sinful nations would know, but, but they are but men. David is asking God that the prideful and sinful nations would see the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, and the judgment of God. David asked that these enemies would see that what they truly are. They're only human. That they would see God as He truly is, the holy, sovereign, and eternal God. Well, how does this psalm apply? First, we want to focus and apply what the holiness of God means. Some of these psalms challenge people's view of God. I know for a fact that many Canadians would not be comfortable for in how the Lord is described here. The Lord is exalted as a sovereign king who rules over the earth. He's holy. He's in heaven. Look at verse 4. You have sat on your throne giving righteous judgment. Verse 7. The Lord sits enthroned forever. He has established his throne for justice. And the Lord is exalted as a righteous God who executes justice on those who reject him. Verse 8, he judges the world in righteousness. He judges the people with uprightness. And we see the fate of the wicked all throughout this psalm. The wicked don't prevail. They're just men. We must know that when we sin against God, we're sinning against his holiness and his majesty. When we read the Old Testament and the New, for that matter, we're struck with God's greatness. I've been, I just finished 1 Samuel, and I've been struck with the holiness of God, the, the book really starts out, the, the first reference to the holiness of God is 1 Samuel 2 verse 2 where Hannah prays and says, There's no one holy like the Lord. And she is not lying. You see the holiness of God from God's judgment on the false god of Dagon to the people of Beth Shemesh who look into the Ark of the Covenant from the sons of Eli who make light of the, of the offerings of the Lord. You see the holiness of God. She does not lie, Hannah. R.C. Sproul helps us understand our sin condition in light of the holiness of God. He writes, Sin is cosmic treason. Sin is treason against a perfectly pure sovereign. It is an act of supreme ingratitude towards the one to whom we owe everything, to the one who has given us life itself. We are saying no to the righteousness of God. We are saying, God, your law is not good. My judgment is better than yours. Your authority does not apply to me. I am above and beyond your jurisdiction. I have the right to do what I want to do, not what you command me to do. When we sin, we've sinned not only against a God of love, but a God of holiness. When we lie, cheat, steal, covet, lust, treasure things before the Lord in our hearts, and the list goes on and on. We sin against the Lord who is exalted. We ought to be praising the Lord, but many times we're sinning against the Lord. Let's store in our hearts God's holiness, that we might sin less against this holy God. But above all, let's thank God, because He's gracious. And that's our last point. The Lord is gracious. In this psalm, we see the grace of God. In Psalm 9, verse 9, the Lord is a stronghold. 9.13, David cries out to God for mercy because he's a merciful God. How can a holy God who hates sin forgive sin? This is only possible because of the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Jesus bears the anger of God for sin so that those who find refuge in Christ can have mercy and grace. Today, if you're outside Jesus Christ, know that apart from Christ, your fate is the same of the fate of of the enemies of God in Psalm 9. In fact, if you're outside of Jesus Christ and rejecting Jesus Christ, you are an enemy of God. You need to see where your sin will lead you, away from God's presence 
for eternity and look to Christ and seek his grace. See the grace of God that is offered to you freely because of Christ's work. Hear what Peter says about Christ's work. Knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Christ Jesus saves completely, even from the deepest, darkest sins. If you're already in Jesus Christ and have experienced His grace, <laughs> this psalm gives us direction. Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord. Recount the deeds of the Lord. Be glad and exult in the Lord and sing to the Lord Most High. Be joyful in what the Lord has done for you. I know a complaining spirit has swept across the country in our culture. But let's ponder and treasure the wonderful grace of Christ given to us. Sing praises, exalt the Lord, his great and awesome name. Tell the deeds of the Lord among the peoples. <clears throat> Use the voice that you have to praise the Lord and tell of the great deeds of God Most High. Thanks for watching and God bless.